John Favreau, I tried to teach him how to cook. And we did an event and he said, you know, I cook too and everything. I said, okay, make an omelet. And I had him make an omelet and I said, this is ready for the garbage can. So I put it in the garbage can and he was sweating. It was a lot of fun because he always thinks he's such a good cook. Hello, I'm Wolfgang Puck and this is a breakdown. First up, ratatouille. How have you decided this evening? Your soup is, is, is excellent. Uh -huh. but, but we order it every time. Yeah, yeah. What else do you yeah, have? Well, something else. We have a very nice foie gras. Yeah, I, I know about the foie gras. The old standby used to be famous for it. What does the chef have that's new? Our customers always ask for special dishes or for special ingredients. We have a lot of vegan customers and so forth. For us in the kitchen, it's almost normal now to accommodate everybody. Not totally everybody, but whatever we can do. I think it's really an important part in the restaurant business to accommodate the guests because they have many choices. If we don't accommodate them, somebody else might. What are you doing? You're supposed to be preparing the gusto recipe. This is, this is the recipe? The recipe doesn't call for white truffle oil. What else have you been? You are improvising. Huh. This is no time to experiment. The customers are waiting. I love the improvisation in cooking. Cooking to me is like painting. You can add a little more pepper or a little more olive oil or some different kinds of herbs and spices and you make a complete different dish. You can make it taste like it came out of Morocco or out of Persia or out of France just by adding different spices. You know, it really looks like it is a French restaurant, the way it's set up and the way they're cooking and in the copper pans, it looks like a French restaurant to me. They love it! Oh, Sir Dino's already asking about it. Oh, about Linguini! I have seven more orders! That's wonderful. Creation really comes in seconds and sometimes you create something that will take a long time. Like for me to perfect a Chinese style duck, like a baking duck, it took me uh, maybe weeks. But to making the smoked salmon pizza, we always made smoked salmon. And then one day I was serving smoked salmon with brioche and one day we ran out of bread. So I just cooked the pizza bread and served it on the side and then it came to my mind like at that moment, I said, why don't I put just everything together? So I put it together, put caviar on it, gave it to Joan Collins and she said, wow, this is my pizza. This is the Joan Collins pizza. I really like my kitchen to be organized chaos. It looks chaotic, but if you're professional, it's actually like an orchestra. Everybody plays their instrument to perfection. You have the chef d'orchestra, the director, and then you have different stations. So you have the stations where they do all the appetizers, maybe all the cold appetizers. Then you have a station for the warm appetizers. Then you have a station for fish. Then you have a station where they do all the meat. Even if it's difficult, you can handle it. But if it's not organized, then it becomes chaotic. Next up, chef. John Favreau, I tried to teach him how to cook. I remember when he came to the Bel Air Hotel one time, we did an event and he said, you know, I cook too and everything. I said, okay, make an omelet. And I had him make an omelet and I said, this is ready for the garbage can. So I put it in the garbage can and he was sweating. It was a lot of fun. So I tried to give him a hard time because he always thinks he's such a good cook. This is an interesting clip because John Favreau, to me at least, should be the chef, not the prep cook. He worked like a prep cook there, so in a way the organization is not really straightened out. But if he didn't have anybody to cook with or nobody showed up, he had to do it. I really think that the knife technique, you could see it was from somebody else, not from John Favreau. Slicing that fast, I think I would be scared if he would have a sharp knife and slice that fast. A lot of people have different thoughts about how many knives you really need. Let's say if you have six knives or eight knives and the sharpening steel and the peeler and the grater and the things like that. So. I really believe you need a box. And these days, the, every chef comes with his own little case and has his knives, because I think it's really an important part to have really sharp knives. You don't want to use a knife you slice smoked salmon with and then use that to cut a bone, because you will break the knife and put dents in it, and then it's useless.
lab work starts in the morning, like we go to the fish market, to the farmer's market, uh, find the best ingredients and then decide what to cook. Sometimes we bring all the sous chefs together and says, what do you do with the Santa Barbara shrimps? What would you do with the hamachi? What would you do with fennel and the new tomatoes? Let's fast forward. No, come over here, look. See this water? Mm -hmm. Bang. Is it hot? Yes. Tell him it's hot. He was checking if the grill is hot, so he put water on it, but you have to be careful not to put cold water on it. So I think for me, I just check it with my hand. I know if it's hot. I don't touch the grill, just put the hand over it and you can feel the heat. But for the inexperienced one, you have to put water in it. Oh, look at that. Okay, see how golden that is? That's how you want it to be every time. You gotta be like a robot. You know, I really love to use the panini grill. I use it in my home very often to cook a steak, to cook fish. My wife loves it. The panini grill is really a great way to cook because it cooks a dish from both sides. Now here they were making a Cuban sandwich. You want it to be cooked and pressed at the same time. I really believe the Cuban sandwich has to be nice and crunchy and crispy in the outside because it's this French baguette, the simple baguette dough, you know, not the sourdough. And then the inside gets warm also. I like when the whole sandwich warms it up, the cheese melts, so you get all the flavors combined together with the mustard, the pickles, whatever you put in it. So you have different temperatures and different textures, which makes a sandwich from just ordinary to extraordinary. You only can fit that much stuff into a truck. I designed a truck specially, you know, we had one catering truck like that and it was fun for one day or for two days, but it's a complicated thing. It looks so easy, but you have to go back to a place where the inspectors check everything. So it's not an easy thing to drive around in a truck. It's certainly not for me. I said, why should I drive in a truck? And why should I serve people standing in the street if I have a beautiful restaurant and many beautiful restaurants really. So no truck for me. I have never eaten out of a truck and I don't intend to because to me, if I eat, it's a special moment. I'm never that hungry that I say, oh my God, let's stop at this uh, truck stop and get uh, a hamburger or a taco or whatever it is. Standing in the street and eating for me is not an experience. Next up, no reservation. The guy at table seven said if you wanted it cremated, he wouldn't have asked for it rare. That is rare. Apparently not rare enough. Rare or medium rare or medium is an established way of cooking things. If it's done the right way, rare is cooked really in the outside, that the inside is warm or hot, but not really cooked. And sometimes people don't understand it quite. And I have customers sometimes that says, this is not medium rare. And I said, what do you mean it's not medium rare? But they really want it medium well. You know, some people say medium rare, but they don't know what it is actually. Look, these are ad agency people. They spend a lot of money here. No tantrums and I just fire another one. I generally don't try to argue with the customers because it gets me upset and maybe the customers too. So I just say, okay, you know what? They don't know exactly what they mean. We have to wait or the manager go to the customer and says, would you like it a little more cooked? And we don't try to make them feel bad in front of their friends or family or business partners, whatever it is. I don't gonna say, what, you don't know what rare is? This is rare, so then he will feel bad and might not come back. From the ass on seven again, he wants to know whether you've ever seen a rare steak before. When I was young, I would get so upset. I used to go and confront the customers, especially when I cooked fish. I remember one time Ray Stark, a famous Hollywood producer, he said, I want my Hollywood really dry. I said, why do you want it dry? He said, that's the way I like my fish. So I went, cooked it really dry, maybe made it extra dry, left it longer in the oven than it even needed. And then he complained to the waiter, my fish is so dry. I went out to him and says, you know what? If you let me cook the way I think the fish should be cooked, you would be a happy man. But you don't know how to cook a fish. That's my profession, you make movies. And he just looked at me and said, what an arrogant ass this chef is. So he never came back. All right, thanks for watching the clip with me. 
Stay tuned for part two.